welcome to Calvary at Home. My name is Sean and I'm the online gathering pastor. So wherever you're listening in from today, you are welcome and we are delighted that you are joining us. You know, at Calvary, it's our vision to double the number of Christ followers in the central PA region by the year 2030. And in the midst, we are praying to catalyze an epic release of Jesus apprentices who are connecting to Christ, to community, and to their calling. And if you live regionally, I invite you to plan to attend a congregational meeting coming up on Sunday, April 21st. This is a great way for you to hear from Pastor Dan about what's happening all over the Calvary movement. And today, I want to say hello to Calvary Online listeners, Richard and Sandy Bowen. They have been part of Calvary Online since the beginning of the pandemic, and I have enjoyed getting to know them. Dick recently had a stroke, so let's pray for them as they navigate through this new normal in their lives. Well, coming up, Pastor Dan will continue our teaching series titled Our Easter Story, and we'll be sharing that Jesus is our resurrection champion, and we can have a new story in Him. The opportunity for a new story is woven through the heart of the gospel. In fact, our whole movement started with a new story every Easter. Every time we celebrate communion or baptism, every Sunday, we celebrate the new day story of a resurrection rewrite. And then after the sermon, Pastor Dan will lead us through a time of communion. So if you don't have juice and crackers near you now, please go ahead and get them. But before we go into a time of worship, let me pray over us. Oh God, it's so good to come together and to be in this space. Thank you for loving us exactly the way that you do. God, we pray over Dick and Sandy Bowen that you would continue to be with them, that you would restore his body, that you would give her patience and strength as she assists him. Would you bless our time together today? Would you bless our worship as we sing about your reckless love for each of us? Because there's nothing we can do to earn or deserve it, but you have favor on every one of us. We love you. Would you be with us now? For it's in your name I pray, amen. Hey, let's spend some time worshiping together and singing about God's amazing love for us. singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so 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 kind to me oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God oh it chases me down fights till I'm found leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I 
I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't love a good story, especially good, true stories. The Easter story is a good story filled with suspense, drama, brokenness, redemption, and a surprise ending. But what if Easter is also a true story? Do you believe that? We could talk about all the evidence for the resurrection, and yet I know that in every case except that of John, even the disciples did not believe until they saw. Though I believe the evidence invites belief, it does not compel belief. So why do I believe? Perhaps because something deep within me longs for more, cries out against the meaninglessness of a life which simply ends without purpose. As C.S. Lewis relates, perhaps it is the very presence of the hunger for something more which indicates that something more actually exists. With every fiber of my being, from the depths of my heart and the full assurance of my mind, I believe it's a true story, not a fairy tale or a myth. The day that Jesus stepped out of the tomb changed the world, changed my world, which means that Easter isn't just a good and true story, it's my story, it's our story. The Easter story is all about the day Jesus decided to invade our present reality, reawaken our desire for something more, and call us out of our graves to truly come alive. That's our story. At least it can be. Hey, welcome to Calvary. Resurrection Sunday has come and gone but our Easter story continues, and so does this series. Easter weekend this year was a a bit more than amazing all throughout the Calvary movement. Besides a full house, dozens of people made decisions to start a story with Jesus, to share their story of Jesus with someone else, and a bunch of people decided to get baptized. And Way of the Cross, man, it was just heart gripping. 967 people from 87 different churches in Central PA went through our immersive remembrance of Good Friday. God is so good, and I'm so grateful to everybody who had a part in it. We had about 150 people movement-wide who made a commitment to ask God for an opportunity to share their Jesus story with someone. And and I've already heard some of the best God-at-work stories. So good. Resurrection Sunday has come and gone, but our Easter story continues. Why? because he's still alive. He's still got the pen and he's not done rewriting our story. I love this story. A number of years ago, a young guy walked kind of unnoticed into a Washington DC metro station. He was wearing a long sleeve t-shirt and a Washington Nationals baseball cap. He pulled a violin out of his case and he began to play. He started with Bach, then moved to Schubert. He played six different pieces, 43 minutes of amazing, beautiful music. And in 43 minutes, exactly 1,097 people passed by the musician. 
It took 63 people going past him before someone actually looked at him. He didn't stop to listen, but he did look. 30 seconds later, someone dropped a buck in the open violin case. It took six minutes before someone actually stopped, stood against the wall for a while, and listened. In 43 minutes, only seven people stopped for at least a minute. 27 people put money in the violin case. He ended up with $32 and change. If you do the math, 1,070 people hurried by without even listening, oblivious that three feet away from them stood Joshua Bell, one of the world's greatest violinists, playing amazing music on a $3.5 million Stradivarius. Three days earlier, Bell had filled Boston's Symphony Hall, where seats went for about $100 a piece on average. But on a cold January morning at the metro station, he was making $32 and change, and nobody was paying attention. So the obvious question this leads to is if a master violinist like Joshua Bell plays some of the greatest classical music on a three and a half million dollar Stradivarius, but nobody listens, is it still art? Of course it is. Because even if no one in the crowd was listening, someone was listening. Joshua Bell listened to all 43 minutes of the music that he played. And if you watch the video, it's on YouTube, he, he's so caught up in the music that the only time he really looks uncomfortable was when he stopped playing to find that nobody else was listening. But the creator of the music always listens to the music. The painter of the masterpiece sees deeply into the brushstrokes of her art. The sculptor with chisel in hand never loses sight of what is to be found inside the rock. And the author of your story, and he loves every word. Your story is the author's passion. Your life is resurrection's aim. And the good news of the Resurrection Sunday is that, is that you have captured God's heart like a beautiful bride on her wedding day, like a, a child nestled in your lap after a long day, like a best friend who would give his life for you. You have captured God's heart. I mean, do you understand the power of this truth? We need to know. We have this deep, need to know that we're not outside the boundaries of somebody's total love, that there is somebody out there who will love us as we are and in hopes of who we will be, someone with whom I can be real and not get rejected. And Jesus says, I'm the one. I love you without limits. You are the music. I'm recreating the story. I'm rewriting. You are not outside the boundaries of my heart. I love you as you are and in hopes of who you will be. I'm offering you a resurrection rewrite. So keep that truth, the heart of Jesus for you, keep that truth in your heart for the next few moments because I wanna give you a whole different picture of Jesus and both of them are important. Both of them are true. He loves you as he is, as you are, and he is our resurrection champion. Now, I love the heart of Jesus, man, it, it grips me. It's the foundation of my life. But I think sometimes we get stuck in this lie that he loves me, but he's not really motivated to help me. Like he can do more than I can imagine. I'm just not sure he will do more than I can imagine for me. So I wanna take us to my second favorite resurrection story. It's found in John chapter 11, verses one through six. And, and here's what it says. A man named Lazarus was sick. He, he lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the same Mary who later poured out expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your friend, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this so although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. So Jesus is hanging out in Bethabara near the Jordan River. Fifteen miles away in Bethany lived Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now these four were really good friends, special friends. In fact, some people call their home in Bethany God's favorite place on earth. So it was only natural that when Lazarus got sick, they called for Jesus. And when Jesus hears this, he says, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. It will end in glory. He doesn't say, Lazarus won't die. He simply says, it won't end in death. And don't miss the order. It's part of the Easter story. Before resurrection comes the cross. Before glory, there's going to be some mess. They called for Jesus. 
Later, we discover that Jesus knew that if he didn't come, Lazarus was going to die. He knew that Mary and Martha and Lazarus would get caught up in all this sick mess and pain mess and funeral mess and grief mess and loss mess. But although he loved them, he didn't come. Jesus decides that an immediate response to this crisis is not in anyone's best interest. He loves them, but he lets Lazarus die. Are you thinking what I'm thinking when you hear that? I mean... Like, that's kind of messed up. Like, no, Jesus, if you love them, if you really love them, you would have come earlier and, and spared them. But the story God is writing in us is not free from the mess of loss and pain and grief. In fact, what if there is no glory without the mess? What if there's no gain without the loss? What if there is no resurrection without first dying? What if there's actually something worse than death? See, Jesus would say worse than dying is to never truly live, to never encounter the the giver of life, to never find the glory in the midst of the mess. So sometimes he doesn't swoop in for the rescue because he knows that we have to go through the mess to get to the glory. So just ask yourself, in my life right now, am I seeking less mess or more glory? And let's be honest, a lot of the time, a lot of our focus is just on less mess. Jesus, can't you just... I don't know, just take away the anxiety. No more depression mess. Jesus, just make our marriage tolerable. Take away the the pain. Sometimes we're more passionate about comfort than we are glory. But man, true new life begins when the glory of God invades our lives. And that's why Jesus loves us too much to settle for less. What if God isn't giving us a way out because the way through leads to glory? Listen, if you're going through a mess right now, and I know a lot of you are, it, it doesn't mean that God doesn't care. And, and it's certainly not that Jesus is just too busy or just emotionally drained. He's not distracted, disappointed, or annoyed by you. He, he's just not going to settle for less than your best. So Lazarus dies, and then Jesus comes. And he has this conversation with Martha about resurrection, and she doesn't really get it. I I think she thinks he's just being all theological and religious and uber spiritual. But in the midst of that conversation, Jesus gives us a preview of what's coming for them and for us. He says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live, live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you Martha, do you in this moment believe this? When Jesus says, do you believe this? What he's really asking is, do you trust me? And then Black Friday and Resurrection Sunday just collide in that question. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you trust me now in the midst of the mess, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the disappointment, in the midst of racism, in the midst of kids running from God, in the midst of political turmoil and war all over the world, in the midst of divorce, in the midst of abusive fathers and depression, in the midst of sin and Satan and death, do you trust me? Do you trust that right now I'm working for your good So this little conversation with Martha and Jesus ends and Martha goes to get Mary. And and I really think at first that Mary just didn't want to come. Just Martha for a while. Mary felt it maybe even a little bit deeper than Martha. Mary felt betrayed and abandoned, unseen. But in her coming, we begin to see this picture of Jesus that I just, I want it to saturate our souls. He is our resurrection champion. As Mary comes, she, she's overwhelmed with grief, maybe even a sense of betrayal. At, at a minimum, deep, deep disappointment in Jesus. Look at John 11, verses 32 through 33. Here's what it says. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people around wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. He was deeply troubled. So the mourners have settled in at Lazarus' house. And in fact, some people would stay there and mourn for weeks. Some were asked to stay because they were really good at mourning. That was the culture of the time. This was not a celebration of life. They're mourning death. And Mary comes out. She's surrounded by people. They're all wailing. They're throwing dirt in the hair, in the air on top of their hair. And this unbearable tsunami of mess just kind of comes sweeping towards Jesus. 
A, a tide of suffering washes over him as Mary falls at his feet and this deep anger welled up within Jesus and he was troubled. Some translations say Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And actually the Greek word here means intense indignation, fury, fervent anger. Jesus is experiencing an intense fury to his very core, to the very core of his soul, his being. He was troubled. The word troubled could be translated as shuddered. His soul, turbulent with this intense anger, with shuddering intensity, he's, he's stirring it up. Jesus rages at death. In fact, in the Greek language, another qualifier is added here that means that Jesus is stirring this up all within himself. He's doing it. This was not a, a spontaneous response to tragedy or evil. He's stirring this up. It's kind of like I remember when I used to play football. In high school, it started Friday morning. In college, Friday night, I'd start stirring myself up. On game day, you put on a game face. Mom gave me space. Lynn gave me even more space. No smiles. Like a little bit irritable, almost angry. We'd get to the locker room dressing for the game in high school. Randy Schaefer would get his helmet on and start knocking his head against the locker. He was stirring himself up. Dave Rita would do the same thing. He just didn't bother to put on his helmet. Me, I'm sitting in the corner with my headphones on, and I look a little bit chill, but inside I'm, I'm stirring myself up. And we all walk out of the locker room kind of silent, guys are making fists, clenching their jaws. All through warm-ups, we're stirring ourselves up. There's an occasional shout, this is our game. Nothing can stop us. The captains pull us in, a low roar starts, and then we're yelling, and the coach is yelling stuff. Nobody can understand him, but he's spitting a lot. We're all stirred up, game on. See, this is Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus. He's stirring up this inner rage in the face of sin and death and Satan. Yes, before the anger came, Jesus wept. I love those two words, that verse, and I, I love his heart, but I don't think the people walked away that day with an image of Jesus weeping in their minds. I think it was the furious rage of Jesus standing at the tomb. Os Guinness, an author, describes that moment this way. He says, Aeschylus, the Greek poet and playwright, used that same word translated angry to describe war stallions before battle. War stallions, as they're rearing up on their hind legs, pawing the air, snorting before they charge, anticipating battle. They know that it's coming and they're ready to charge. And so stirred up with this furious intensity against all the mess and all the darkness and all the loneliness and all the sin and brokenness and all the death and all that the enemy of our souls has done, Jesus advances as a champion prepared for battle. Entering this world as the creator, as his father's son, instead of beauty, he discovered raw ugliness. Instead of harmony, he found brokenness. Instead of glory, he found mess. And everywhere he looked, God's masterpiece was scratched up, tattered, a mess. He sees the mess of our lives, the struggles of our stories, the disappointment, the abnormality of death always at work, and he's not okay with it. He is not okay with it. And from Resurrection Sunday on, I'm telling you, he has been resurrecting and redeeming our stories, just like he did on that day. That's verses 38 through 41. It says Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb this cave with a stone rolled across the entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. He's stinking dead. The smell will be terrible. And Jesus simply said to her, Martha, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? And so they rolled the stone aside. Standing near the tomb of his friend, this fury rising up inside. It's not simply the death of his friend that he rails against. It's the hand behind death. It's the power behind evil. This death symbolizes the accumulation of everything that's gone wrong with the story of the world. Evil and pain and sorrow and suffering and arrogance and despair and hopelessness and violence and injustice and cruelty and loneliness and sin. And as he lifts his head to pray... God gives those standing around just a glimpse of Christ filled with power and authority and he gets this look on his face and he shouts, Lazarus, come out! <laughs> and Lazarus came out. Didn't I tell you, Mary? You'll see glory if you believe. So can we see the glory in our story? 
in those tombstone times? Can we see the glory in our story? Do you believe? I mean, that's where it all starts. This is our story. Resurrection Sunday has passed, but our Easter story continues. What Jesus did that day, he'll do over and over and over again in our resurrection rewrite. When Jesus broke that tomb and put Satan in a submission hold, resurrection power was let loose in the world. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the resurrected Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You are a new creation. I mean, would you say that with me? Whisper it if you're a little bit embarrassed. Yell it out if you're by yourself. I am a new creation. I am a new creation. Listen, let this truth saturate your soul. Last weekend on Resurrection Sunday, we talked about the change in the followers of Jesus between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. They, they were not just inspired by a good story. They were changed, deeply forever changed. And that, that's our resurrection rewrite. If you believe in Jesus, at this very moment, your story is going through a rewrite. There are things that are true of you right now that were not true of you before you belonged to Christ. When we become Jesus followers, not only do we get a new story, we get a new identity. And, and here's what I found in my study of scripture and in my own personal experience of life. I found that when God begins to rewrite our story, there are some common themes that always shape the pages of our life, always. Now granted, sometimes we have to read our story with the eyes of faith. But if you are a follower of Christ, these themes are part of your story, regardless of what you feel, regardless of what you think you've earned, what you do, what's been done to you. These themes define you at the deepest parts of your soul. I'm just going to share four of them from one of my favorite chapters of one of my favorite New Testament books. There are more. And at the end, you're going to get a sheet with more. <laughs> but we'll start here. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Here's what it says. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Because we are united with Christ, we are in Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. In other words, long before the book of Genesis was even written, before day one was in the books, you were in his heart. He loves you. He's chosen you. In Christ, you are without fault in his eyes. He has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. They're all available. God is not annoyed with you. He's not looking for a reason to kick you out of the family. In Christ, we are blessed, not busted. And this is God's heart for you. He's not looking to bust you a new one. He's looking to bless you a new one. God says when it comes to blessing you, I am all in. Not physical blessing, not at this point, but even better. Every blessing from the Spirit that makes our spirits come alive. Bless, not busted. That's the theme. Begin to look for that in your story. And then Paul writes in Ephesians 1 verse 5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. We are adopted, not abandoned. Chosen and loved by your Father. This is what... This is what he wanted to do. You, you are not the have to of God. You are his want to. He wanted to go to the cross for you. I think if, if you had to sum up in a single word what God is up to in the world, it's family. He's creating a family. I mean, that's why the universe exists. And this is your story. I, I love the story that Larry Crabb tells of a friend who had been raised in a pretty angry family. Mills were silent, angry, or sarcastic. But but down the street was this old-fashioned house with a big front porch where, where a happy family lived. Larry's friend told him that when he was 10 years old, he began excusing himself from his table as soon as he could without being yelled at, and he'd walk down the block to that old-fashioned house. He'd crawl under the porch and just sit there listening to the sounds of laughter around the dinner table, longing for a seat at that table. As Larry counseled him, Larry asked him to just imagine what it would have been like if the father in the house had known that he was huddled beneath the porch and sent his son to invite him in. He asked him to envision accepting the invitation and 
and then sitting at the table, maybe even accidentally spilling his glass of water and hearing the father roar with delight, get him more water and a dry shirt. I want him to enjoy the meal. Listen, you've got so much more than just an invitation to sit at the table. You are chosen and loved and adopted into the family of God. That's one of the themes of your story. It's part of your identity. Then look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. It says that he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and he forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness upon us. He purchased our freedom. That's the word redemption. In Paul's day, it would have brought to mind the life of a slave. Paul is saying you've been bought out of slavery. Your freedom from sin was purchased. You're no longer a slave to sin. Your past has been redeemed. You were bought with a price. In other words, in Christ, we are treasured, not trashed. Our Easter story is about the treasure that God sees in us. You're not God's secondhand car, his goodwill delivery. You're a special treasure, not chosen because you're special, but special because you're chosen. I mean, do you have any idea how much you matter to God? Robert Lewis was meeting with a young guy who was getting his PhD at the University of Chicago. Lewis was a pastor and author. University of Chicago is a prestigious school. They were having coffee, and, and the young guy looked at him and said, you know, in the end, it's not going to matter. He was actually trying to work up the energy to finish his dissertation. He said, it won't matter. Lewis said, what what do you mean it won't matter? I mean, this guy had done amazingly well in school. He said, well, here's the deal. I'll finish it and I'll show it to my dad. And he'll say something like, is that all you got? Couldn't you do any better? This young man had been striving his whole life to become someone his dad would love, someone who mattered, always trying to jump a little bit higher in hopes of hearing his dad say, you've done good, son. But it, it was never enough. I mean, how often do we go through our days feeling like we got to do well in order to matter? we got to earn it. Listen, God did not choose you because you're pretty or smart or rich. or He didn't choose you because of your IQ, EQ, or any other Q. Your bank account did not get you in any more than your personality or the number of people who follow you on TikTok. And because those things never got you in, the lack of those things will not keep you out or kick you out. This is your story. He chose you because he loves you and you're loved just because. And that's not all. <laughs> the final theme is one of my favorites. Look, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. It says, And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago, And the Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us the inheritance He promised and that He has purchased us to be His own people. And He did this so that we would praise and glorify Him. The Spirit is God's guarantee. In some translations it says you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. In in Paul's day, a seal was a mark of ownership, a mark of authenticity and authority. In Paul's day, if a letter was delivered to you with a seal of the king, it was a king's way of saying, this is the real deal. You can believe what you read inside. It's been written by my own hand. In other words, the words of this story are yours, they're mine. The words of this story are true. It's the real deal. The spirit inside of you is my witness, God says, that the story I'm writing on the pages of your life is true, but there's more. (laughs) Because the Holy Spirit isn't the full deal. The spirit in you is just a down payment of your full inheritance. And without trying to figure out what all that means, can I simply tell you, it means the best is yet to come. So let me ask you, what would your life be like? How would your story change if you really believed to the core of your being that the Jesus, the Jesus with all power and authority, the Jesus who rages at all the mess of life, the Jesus who called Lazarus out of the grave, the Jesus whose death let resurrection power loose in the world, if that Jesus was your risen and living resurrection champion, if that Jesus was scripting your resurrection rewrite, how would that change? What's going on in here? 
and what's going on in here. If you really believe that, if you believe that you are blessed, not busted, if you believe that, that you're adopted and not abandoned, that you are chosen and loved by Father God, if you believe, truly believe that you're a treasure, not trash, if you believe that the best is yet to come, man, if that's true, you have hope for every hard season. You have power available in every weak moment. You have a family around you for the loneliest of times. It doesn't matter what others say about you, how they treat you, because you were loved and chosen before you were even born. You are treasured by the creator of all things. And as we go to communion, let me simply say this, the cross is proof. It is the ultimate blowout love burst of God. I mean, think about it. From the eyes of heaven, I, I kind of think the resurrection was no big deal. I mean, do you think the angels of heaven waited with bated breath to see if God could raise Jesus from the dead? Were they surprised when the creator of life gave life to the bringer of life? I mean, in heaven's eyes, the resurrection had to have been a little bit anticlimactic, a little bit ho-hum. But the cross, oh my God, they must have whispered in the halls of heaven, will he really do it? I mean, does he love them that much, all of them so much that he will climb up on that tree and take all the sin and shame of the world upon himself and experience their loneliness and brokenness and their rebellion? Does he love them that much? And the answer was yes. But we never would have known that without the resurrection. Before the resurrection, the cross was nothing more than abounding despair, unmerciful judgment, and victorious evil. It was the story of our life, but the resurrection changed the cross from a symbol of deep despair to a symbol of ultimate hope, an ultimate hope that is built upon a deep, deep love and a great, great power. A love and a power that offers us a whole new story. Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray that in the days to come, we would believe the truth of your story and reject the lies of the enemy, the lies of the world, the lies of our own lives that tell us we, we gotta earn it. The lies of our, our own lives that just say, you're, you're never gonna be good enough. God is disappointed in you. God is annoyed with you. You, you gotta earn it. God, I, I pray that we would step into the reality of our identity, that we would step into the reality of our identity with a full assurance that we are, we are blessed, we are adopted, we are treasures, <laughs> and the best is yet to come. God, we thank you for the cross of Christ that we're gonna celebrate in a few moments. We thank you for the love of God, the, the blowout, <laughs> outburst of love that came from God when, when you climbed up on that cross, Jesus. We thank you for your resurrection. We thank you that you are writing in our lives a new story. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. As we move to a time of communion, and we remember the, the blowout, outburst of love that came from the heart of Jesus as he went to the cross, I, I want you to think about the fact that, like I said, the cross is proof <laughs> We wouldn't have known it without the resurrection, but the cross is proof of what God has done, how much he loves you, what he is doing in your life. You are a new creation of you, are a Jesus follower. You celebrate today the new creation of Christ. And so I encourage you to join with me and take a piece of the bread. Bread represents his body that was broken for you. And take and eat, and as you eat, remember his story and your story. And when Jesus sat with his friends, he said that this cup represents my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. And he said again, do this. When you do this, remember me. And so we remember Jesus. And we look forward to our stories. Take and drink.
one of the resources that we're giving you is this sheet that says on one side, who am I? And, and on the sheet, there's just a number of scripture verses that are true of you if you are a follower of Christ, if you've devoted your life to him, if you said, Jesus, I believe in you, I want you to be my Lord and Savior, I accept the gift of life that you've given me on the cross. These things are true of you, regardless of who you are, what you've done, what's been done to you. Your past does not change the reality of these, these verses, these truths. So I just want to encourage you in the days to come to get our minds set straight, to get to get ourselves into the story that God is writing for you, the resurrection rewrite, I want to encourage you to read through this list every day. Read through this list of things that are true about you every day. Every one of them is a scripture. I'm a new creation. I'm in Christ. I'm chosen by God. I'm free. I'm God's child. I'm Christ's friend. I'm God's workmanship. I'm a slave of righteousness, not of sin. I'm a member of Christ's body. I've been justified, completely forgiven. I'm forever free from con condemnation. I've been given a spirit of power and love and self-discipline, and I may approach God with boldness. These are true of you and your story, regardless of anything that's going on around you. As you begin to believe these things, get them into your heart and mind and see the themes worked out in your story, it's gonna make a difference. And I encourage you in the days to come to read through this every day. Let me pray for you and then we'll take a little bit of time and worship. Father God, thank you so much for the truth of the story that you are writing in each and every person. God, would you pour your spirit out upon us? Would you show us the story that you're writing in our lives and through our lives? God, we're so grateful for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And all alone, growing comfortable. Are you too scared to move and walk out of this tomb? Buried underneath the lies that you believe, safe and sound, stuck in the ground, too lost to be found. You're just asleep, and it's time to leave. Come on. Take a breath, you're alive now Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us Out from the grave like Lazarus So brand new, power, death, good and all new Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us Out from the grave like Lazarus Sin away. Now the door is open wide, and the soul's been rolled aside. The old is gone, the light has come. So come on and rise up, take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? So
Uh, it was another great time to gather together, to sing and worship and to get into the word and to celebrate through communion. You know, Pastor Dan shared this. He said, what part of your story needs a resurrection rewrite? Here's what I've found in my study of scripture and in my experience of life. I found that when God takes up the pen, there are some themes that always shape the pages of your life. God's story for you includes themes like you're blessed and not busted, you're adopted, not abandoned, you're treasured, not trashed, and the best is yet to come. These themes are the story of your new life in Jesus Christ. And I love this, and I hope that this resonates with you as well. We also have a resource for you today. Dan shared about a list of scriptural truths about your identity in Jesus. You can find that list at calvarysc.org slash respond. Go, grab that list and write down those verses and put them somewhere so that you can see them every day. Let them be reminders for you who you are in Jesus. Well, I continue to be excited and expectant for all that God has for his church. And it was so great to be with you today. You know, if you have any questions about anything or if you wanna pray with somebody, please, would you just reach out to us? Well, hey, that's all for today. We look forward to seeing you next time. Living with